Okay. Uh, we, we're looking at Kings, and we, this is only the fourth session, so we haven't been in Kings long. Uh, and, and to this point, who has been the focus in the book of Kings? On whom have we been focused? Solomon. 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 And, and who was Solomon? David. Okay, David, David's son. And there was an overlap when we looked at uh, 2 Samuel and Kings. And who was in that overlap between the two books? Well, actually, Solomon was. You know, that was certainly one. But David was, David was too, because at the end of Solomon, uh, Samuel, David hadn't died. Uh, and he, he dies in the beginning of uh, Kings. And Coco, how, uh, how does the transition of kingship occur? Because David's king, but he's got other sons. Yeah, there was you know, around now. Some of them, you know, died as a result of stuff. But there were other king, uh, other sons around. And there was one that resents the fact that he. Was yeah, yeah, well, he he before before David died. Of course, that was a little different than Absalom, who rebelled against David, uh, and he wanted to sort of declare himself so heir to the throne, sort of regent. While David ages, and we talked about getting older and not being able to do things, that he would sort of help his dad until his dad died, and then he would have full authority. But until then, he would kind of be power of attorney, have power of attorney, so that he could continue David's David's reign. And what? How does? Why isn't he king? Because that wasn't Solomon. Why isn't he king? Who? The David's other son that that sort of yeah. and and establishes in Jerusalem is going to be you know declare himself to be regent. What? How does Solomon then become come king? Because Bathsheba. Okay, yeah, we got ba Bathsheba working with Solomon. working with Solomon, who's also working with. You remember Nathan is also working with Nathan because remember they sort of broke into sides and Joab was with the other one and Nathan and and so was um, oh gosh the other priest uh, sided with the the son but um, Nathan and Bathsheba ends up siding with with Solomon and kind of as a as a cherry on top of the sad David's. Sunday, what do you remember? This what they tell him. Told him that he promised. He had promised that Solomon. Solomon would be king, and was there any evidence that he promised? No, but they told him he had, and they even set it up. You know that Bathsheba would say, "Remember when you said Solomon was going to be king?" I don't really remember. And then Nathan would come in and say, "Are oh, you talking about that time when you said Solomon was going to be king?" And David says, "Well." I must have done it. Uh, and so he, what ends up happening with Solomon and David? David makes him, really makes him king, and Solomon goes full board, more than his brother. You know, he is, he is anointed, uh, and he assumes the throne, and he is king in all, you know, in all practical terms, even though David is still alive. Uh, so Solomon becomes king, and, and what does he do? Based on what we've read, what does he do to, to sort of establish himself as king? What, what, what's that? Well, he builds a temple. Hold on that because we want to do that. In fact, that's what I'm going to ask in just a minute. What does he do in practical? Because he's got some, some loose ends, right? Because he's got a brother that wanted to be king and he's got a general who supported his brother who leads his army, and all of those things are tricky because if he leaves those things untied, they could become problems, problems in, the future, in very practical terms. Now, right at the beginning as Solomon's doing that, what, what, do, we, what do we know about Solomon and his relationship with, with God? He as the writer, as the writer puts it down. He, he talks to God. Yeah, he talks to God. So Solomon is, is close to God. So it's very, he's got to be very careful in how he writes about Solomon dealing with these loose ends that if he doesn't tie up, he 
Now he's going to have to tie him up later. And so as he ties up the loose ends, and what does he end up doing to these folks who are issued? They end up dying. These folks. He gives them choices. But he, that's right. So he gives them choices in each of the situations. The person makes the wrong choice. Makes the wrong choice which enables us to look at Solomon and say, he didn't, he didn't kill them, he didn't murder them. Blood is not on his hands. It, it, it's not like Uriah, David and Uriah. You know, Solomon gave them the option, which they accepted, and then they violated their, their covenant, and so Solomon has the opportunity to eliminate them. And so he eliminates these problems. And, and what else do we learn? So Solomon is now king. What does, right at the beginning of his reign, for what does he ask? Wisdom. He asks for, for wisdom. You know, do you want power? Do you want land? Do you want you know, riches? And he says, no, I want wisdom. And so Solomon is going to be associated with, with wisdom. And there's a little story that, that the writer offers that shows the kind of wisdom that Solomon uses. And this story was... Two women and their baby. The, the, the two women and the baby, and you know Solomon ends up solving this. So we've got we've got Solomon, then a wise king, uh, established. And Judy, you said one of the things he builds is the temple, right? And and why does he build the the temple? According to the writer, God told him to do it. You know, he did it. God said no to David. God said. Yes, to Solomon. And uh, how would you describe this temple that Solomon builds? <laughs> wow. And, and as it's, the description is given, it is given in great detail. What, what, might, that, what might that tell you about the temple? If, if the building itself is, is, is described in such detail, and it's even more in Chronicles, you know, what does that tell you about the temple? If this writer, writing on papyri, you know, spent so much time talking about the, the, the vessels in the temple and, and minute descriptions of the, the uh, uh, molten sea and the altar, and mm -hmm. the, you know, it's a lot. Of, yes, you, you read it, you say, I, I got it, you know. Right. Even if we were reading in English, you know, so, something written on a computer where there's no cost involved, that's you know, that's enough. I don't need to know any more. Why would he include this? What what does that tell you about the temple? How important? Okay, it says how it really tells us how important it is. Important for people then, and important for people. Uh, well, now, yeah, yes. now when the people, the the audience, yeah. the, the audience of this. Now, what was the purpose? What's the purpose of the temple? To put God's, what you call it? In. Okay, the ark is going to be in the temple. So it's going to be the place that surrounds the ark. It's, it's going to serve a, another role. What is, what is the, the housing the ark is important. Why is that important? What, what is the temple going to be? It, it's going to be the spiritual center of Israel. Why is it the spiritual center? Because it's stable where before the ark was an attempt that moved. Uh, it was an attempt that moved, that's right. Okay, good. Now we'll get... The, it was an attempt that moved. Why was it an attempt that moved, the ark? Why was the ark in, under a tent that was constantly moving? God didn't want it in the building. Why? It were settled now. Right. Why didn't God want it in the building? Why did God want it under a tent? Because he moved with the Yes, he that's it. Because God, is, God moves. And that's what the ark was. The far later, the ark is going to be called the footstool of God. You know, so that's what they envision. So the, the temple, the, the ark and the, the tent of meeting, where the ark was, was settled, is a tent because God was a God that moves. Now, why would God be a God that moves? Because, because, the people people because the people are spread out and they're shepherds and they've got sheep and they're moving from Egypt to, to Israel. So you needed a God that 
moved. You can't build a temple when you're moving every time you move, right? You can build an altar, right, to have sacrifices, but an altar is just made of a pile of rocks. And you move someplace, you get another pile of rocks and perform. So the, the presence of God was moving. And this is the God of the Israelites. Now, they're not moving anymore, right? They're in the land. Now they've got a government in the land. Now the, their perception of God starts changing. And that's why I pushed on the temple. The temple is the house where the ark is going to be. And it is going to be the spiritual center. Why? Because the people were there and that's where they go to worship. Why? Because God's there. That, that's it. Because God's there. You know, God is in that temple. That's the house of God. God dwells in this temple. And that's what people see. Even in the story, it talked about God filling the temple. His spirit, the kavod of God, when it enters the temple, this becomes the dwelling place of God. Now that's, that's a radically different view than what the Israelites have had in the past. And it's also a different view than we have. Because we think of a God that is present everywhere, you know, not present more in one place than another. But that's not how the Jews saw it, and nor ancient, other ancient people. God dwelt in places. And that's why you went to a place to worship God, because that's where God was. Okay? And that's what we see in this, in this temple. But it does become this spiritual center of Israel, which is going to become, which is really important then, is going to be really interesting. At the end of the set, what we talk about today and, and next week, the fact that in Jerusalem, in this temple built by Solomon, the presence of God dwells. In fact, when you read the book of Ezekiel, and this is a big deal in the, for ancient people, Ezekiel is part of a group of uh, folks from Judah, leaders from Judah, that have been uh, taken out or exiled in the first conquest of Judah. And so Ezekiel is way in another part of the uh, Babylonian Empire. You know, he is way, way in Mesopotamia somewhere. And he has visions. He's not in Jerusalem. Jeremiah is. Ezekiel isn't. And one of the visions he has of what's going on in, in Jerusalem before the city falls again to the Babylonians, in his vision, he sees the temple in his vision. And guess what happens with the temple? He sees the presence of God leave the temple. He sees God leave the temple. Therefore, God isn't there anymore. And the Babylonians can conquer it. You know, can, take, can now take and tear down the temple because God isn't there anymore. And that's important because if God were there, they couldn't do it. You know, they wouldn't be able to do it. That would mean their gods were stronger. You know, and the God of Israel isn't. So... It, this, this Lord has to leave. The presence of Gavod has to leave the temple before it's conquered. And this is the temple that's being built here. Okay, so we've got Solomon. This becomes one of the things that Solomon done to establish Israel as a kingdom, establish his authority. He set up a government. Okay, he set up a government. And what about, what do we see in this government? Organization yeah. with a different. Uh, I don't know how you want to put it. Yeah. Departments. Yeah. You know, he sets up departments, right? Yeah. You know, and has somebody responsible, changes the the internal structure of the kingdom, moving away from the old tribal divisions, because he's looking to administrate it. You know, he's an administrator. Okay, so he does that. He organizes the government. What else does he do? Forced labor. Okay, he does forced labor. That's one of the things. That's always lurking in the background, it's going to show up again. Uh, today. What else? In terms of, in, in terms of uh, the land he governs, his, the military situation, what's, what is he dealing with militarily? I'm sorry, I didn't really get it. I wasn't into reading. This. Okay, well that's fine. No, well, really. You can even guess it. What do you think is their military, the military situation in Israel? He puts down all attempts to... All the attempts to, to overthrow him are gone. And in fact, he's pushing. You know, the boundary of Israel is now much greater than what was promised 
and it, it, when they took the land. You know, he's extending it all the way to the Euphrates River. So, you know, the kingdom is, is big, it is secure, it is organized, it has a spiritual focus. Yeah. And it's united because each one took a turn in providing provisions uh, to support him and his center. Got it. So everything, this is a wonderful, wonderful place. You see, it's, a, it's sort of a utopia. At least politically, it is absolutely, totally secure. You, you almost, you, you could say it's, it's a little like the United States was in the, the 90s after the fall of the Soviet Union. You know, that there was nobody else. It was us. Or Britain in the, in the late 1800s. You know, there just wasn't anybody that was directly competitive anymore. You know, we were the, the ones. And so that's kind of Solomon's situation. And we're going to continue it here, but there are some potential issues. What are some of the potential issues that we just had dropped in? We've mentioned, we mentioned one of them just a, a little while ago. Well, he built a special place for his wife. Ah, let's, let's think about it, the wife, because he's, he's got, we've, we've heard one wife, right? Mm -hmm. And what makes that wife... Interesting. She is a daughter of Pharaoh. And so daughter of Pharaoh, he builds her when he's building his house, which is also described, the forest of Lebanon, which becomes part of this story, part of this house where he receives foreign emissaries. Uh, he's got a foreign wife and he builds her her own little house, right connected to the palace. Why does this daughter of Pharaoh become a potential Danger. Because she, has, she doesn't worship, worship the same God as Solomon. Okay. So we got a problem She's maybe. A different idol. She worships other gods. She worships other gods. And that's a potential problem. We don't we haven't seen it sort of bear any kind of fruit. But you know, that's there. You know, the forced labor is there. And those are gonna be the two things that are really gonna cause problems for Solomon later, but we're not even there yet. As we, as we get into the uh, ninth chapter, what is, what is Solomon? Solomon has, has built his temple, right? What's now, now what? Now that the temple is, it has been built, now what? The Lord appeared to him. Okay, and what does the Lord say when the Lord appears to him? Okay, so what, what has the Lord done? What does the Lord do here with, Sol, with Solomon? He's making this covenant. And, and Solomon's, his side of the covenant, God's presence is coming from his side. What, what does the Lord expect of Solomon? For him to keep the, the, his laws. His okay. Laws. Going to keep his laws. Going to, going to follow him. Okay. Now, the fact that this is established right at the beginning, what might that tell you? Because we're talking about a writer who's writing this history, shaping this history. If he's injecting this here, what might that tell you about the future? History repeats itself. Okay, in what sense? That Solomon is going to not to struggle at some point. That Maybe. Solomon may struggle. He, he's either going to keep it perfectly, or not. I mean, why else would he inject this covenant into the story? Now, how long did it take for him to build the temple? Seven years. Was it seven years? Okay. He, he builds, in verse 10, he builds the temple. At the end of 20 years, he's built two houses, right? He's built a house for God and a house for himself. For himself. Now, he owes Hiram from Tyre, and Tyre is right on the coast. They're Phoenician people, traders. They have ships everywhere, Phoenicians. Um, also control Lebanon, and Lebanon's known for cedars. How does, and, and we heard that Hiram supplied a lot of the wood for the, for the temple. How does Solomon pay the debt he owes Hiram? 
gives them some towns. But not on the coast. And, what's that? Not near the coast. Not near the coast. No, it gives them in, in Galilee, right? Mm-hmm. Now, Galilee is part of the land that was promised to the, the people of Israel. And he, Solomon gives these towns to Hiram. Now, just as, as, I, as, I, as I read it, I thought, oh, hmm, that's interesting. What, what has Solomon done? But, Which becomes kind of, kind of interesting. That he, to pay this debt, he's given these towns. Jewish towns. Yeah. Hmm, that's kind of interesting. But he wasn't pleased. Yeah, well, Hiram wasn't because he thought he was getting snookered. Uh, that the towns weren't weren't great, uh, but what is what is Solomon doing by giving these giving away these towns to a foreign power? Splitting up the territory. Yeah, he's taking land that God gave his people and transferring it to somebody else to pay debts. Hmm, that's kind of interesting. That's sort of what kings do. They don't do them anymore. <laughs> I know you, you don't have this kind of stuff happening now, but you sure did then. Uh, so, hmm, that's kind of kind of interesting. Um, what what ends? Up, how does that end up working working out? Because what does Hiram do eventually with with um, Solomon? He tells him right. Tells him what he'd done. And but he still, it it doesn't seem to interfere with their relationship because so they had a had a good, good relationship. Did you say he did? Well, he confronted. He told okay. Solomon that he wasn't pleased with this territory that he had given in exchange for everything that Hiram had done. I had don't given. think they were worth as much as what he gave. Yeah, Solomon. yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, okay, so. You know, it sounds fine, but the little thing causes us to go, hmm, that's interesting. What else does, so he's built, Solomon has built, his house has built a house for the Lord. What else does he build? His own. Okay, what, he built his own house. His yeah, what else is he, what else is he building? For his wife. Well, he builds for his wife, yeah. What else? He builds a wall, builds a wall around Jerusalem. That'd be pretty important because that's if that's your center, you want to protect it. And like I said, Jerusalem's on top of a mountain. And, you know, but be on top of a mountain surrounded by a wall, that makes you pretty secure if you're, if you're being attacked. What else does he do? Build ships. Well, he, yeah, he, he builds, other, builds other towns, fortifies other towns, uh, you know, that's one of the things. Hold on the ships because we're going to get there in just a second. Keep, you know, he's working with other towns in his realm, right? He strengthens them. And what does he do with the people in, the foreign people in the land? Makes them slaves. He makes the foreign people slaves. And he lists the, the people in the land. And, and that sounds reasonable, right? That he would make foreigners slaves. Yeah, as opposed to the... He doesn't make his own people. He doesn't make his own people, so that's a that's a good thing. Well, no. well, there's a problem. Because the foreign people weren't supposed to be there in the first place. Well, foreign people weren't supposed to be there in the first place. Also, the law is really clear about how you're supposed to treat foreign people in your land. And the law doesn't say when you have foreign people in your land, what you need to do is make them slaves. In fact, when you look at Leviticus, it says... When foreign, when an alien uh, resides with you in your land, you shall not oppress the alien. The alien who resides with you shall be to you as the citizen among you. You shall love the alien as yourself, for you were aliens in the land of Egypt. I am the Lord your God. That's the, that's the law. That's the law. Is Solomon following the law? I know he is not. Doing something that is expedient, Maybe doing something you could say is necessary. The problem is, it's not obeying the law. Little thing. So we got that dropped in here, given away to pay debts, land that God had given to the people. Kind of fudging the law right here in, in not treating aliens, you know, foreigners in the land the way 
they were supposed to be treated. So it's a little different. But his people, he's not enslaving, enslaving them. And Pharaoh's daughter has her own house. Um, and, but is Solomon still close to God? Well, three times a year, he does what? Sacrifice. Sacrifice. He goes sacrifices, performs sacrifices. So Solomon is still doing what he's supposed to do. But I'm thinking the writer is good enough that he's just dropping in these little things that cause the reader to go, hmm, mm -hmm. hmm, that's interesting. Things are still on the up. You know, they're still going up. But you go, hmm, he, maybe he shouldn't be doing that. You know, maybe that's not what he should be doing. Now, Shelly, you said he started one of the other things that's a big deal in this is building ships. building ships. Now, does he, and he's building ships, uh, these are ships on the Red, that would have access to the Red Sea. Okay, uh, so is he building the ships? Why would, he be, why would he be building ships? Why would he need a navy? Why would he build a navy? Well, the, the, the men that he chose to man the ships, they would sail out and bring goods Okay. In. So what is he doing with his, his ships? How is he using these ships? Making money. Yeah, he's making money. He's trading. You know, these, this is a, a, not a, mili a, a military navy. This is a merchant navy. And he is, he is trading, right? Now, to, to trade, though, we, we're talking about Israelites, right? And their background is not on the water. You know, their background is what? Shepherd. Yeah, shepherd, herd and sheep. And, you know, herd and sheep, herd and sheep is a whole lot different than sailing on the water. So he's looking at his people. He doesn't have any, right? So where does he end up getting the sailors for his fleet? Hiram. Now, why would he go to Hiram, the king of Tyre? Because he has experienced crews. He has experienced crews. Tyre is right on the ocean. They're Phoenician. They trade all over the place. So he gets Solomon sailors. Now, so the sailors Solomon is using are from Hiram, aren't Jews. Then they're Phoenicians. Hmm, that's interesting. <laughs> So what, what's the potential problem there, that you've got this, this fleet manned by non-Israelites? He's putting his trust in people that aren't within his own realm. Yeah, yeah. Who also then would, what's, what would appear to be the most important thing for the writer of not only this book of the Kings, but also what we saw and Samuel, and Judges, and Joshua, and Numbers, and Exodus. What's most important to, those, to the writer? Is it being politically astute? Is that most important? Doing the politically right thing. I'd say not, because mm. that's opening up an area that they could be attacked from. So that's not most important to the writer. You know, that the, the leader was a, was a stinker, but politically, he really did good things. So what is? If politics isn't the most important, military, is the, is the writer, the book says, as long as you're strong, you're, the, you're, you're doing the right thing. Is that the way the writer views what's most important? No. No. What is most important? They were obeying God. Obeying God. This covenant with God becomes most important. That is most important to this writer. I mean, we got it all the way back to Genesis. You know, either you're for God or you're again, again God. God. You know, and it doesn't matter the other stuff. You were judged by whether you're obeying God, whether you're keeping the covenant or not. That's what this writer is saying. Now, another writer would have a different perspective, but that's what this writer is, is saying. And by getting these foreign, these foreigners to work on the ships, worshiping other gods, that creates a big difference. Yeah, big difference. You uh, good Israeli, so, uh, Israelite sailors be worshiping the Lord God, but these Phoenician sailors aren't. Right. They're not going to be doing that.
So, you know, again... The trust thing about, you know... And dedication. Yeah. You know, they are not Israelites, you know. Again, this isn't... This doesn't undermine his success because as the writer writes this, he immediately follows with what? He Solomon sends out this fleet. And what happens when he sends out this fleet? They brought back gold and, um, and delivered it to him. Lord have mercy. They are bringing him all kinds of gold from Ophir. And Ophir is right on the, the coast of the Red Sea. So it's in, in Arabia. So... It, they're, they're bringing in all kinds of stuff. So, successful? Yeah. So they're yeah. trading for this gold, or how are they... Well, they, would, they would be... Well, that's, that's interesting. <laughs> they they would need... Like hist historically, they would have to trade. People aren't just going to turn it over. Right. But he doesn't mention that. Why do you think he wouldn't mention, the writer wouldn't mention? Well, Solomon had to send da-da-da-da-da, you know, but, and got in exchange all this gold. What impression is the writer leading us to, to have with respect to Solomon and his kingdom? He takes, but he doesn't give. Okay, okay. And, and he's, he's taking, and is this a good thing for the kingdom? For the kingdom. For the kingdom, yeah. yeah. This is, the kingdom is getting, is getting rich. Solomon's getting rich. Because it talks about Solomon, too. Mm -hmm. you know, but Solomon, the kingdom, is in great shape. So it's almost like the writer. That's a great point, Janet. I hadn't really thought about it. But you know, it makes sense as he presents it. He wants to present that, this, that Israel is, later he'll even say it, Solomon and Israel is viewed, how are they viewed internationally? We'll get to it in a minute. A rich they, are, they, they aren't just a rich kingdom. They are... The richest king. Solomon is the greatest king. You know, other kings go to him for advice. This is, I think, by having it coming in, is really emphasizing just how powerful and wealthy and secure and strong this new kingdom is under Solomon. A great point, Jan. I hadn't thought of it. But it makes sense in this context if that's what the writer wants to wants to emphasize. And in fact, kind of reinforce it, who ends up showing up in, in Queen chapter Sheba. 10? Queen of Sheba. And Sheba is really close to Ophir. It's, it's in, in Arabia. So it would be in that, in that, that corner, you know, right across from the, the um, Horn of Africa. You know, it's, she isn't Ethiopian. Sheba is, is Arabian. So she's, and, and why does she come? But Ophir, they get gold, right? Yeah. Why does she end up coming? Because she heard of the, the fame of Solomon. And so, well, and that would make sense because really trading, good. they're trading with Ophir, she hears about it. And, and what does, why does she come according to the writer? She wants to see if it's true. She wants the to. things that she heard about him being so great. So great. And in particular, so wise, because that's kind of what's emphasized. And how is she going to prove that he's wise? What does she come Testament. with? She has a set of questions she's going to warn. Who wants to be a millionaire? Who wants to be Solomon? She's got to tell, this is, this is harder than Jeopardy. <laughs> so she's ready to ask, ask Solomon these hard questions. So when she comes, what does the writer tell us about her? Oh, she came with a, car a caravan of camels carrying spices and large quantities of gold, stone precious stones. Which is telling us about she is. She's rich too. She is very rich, and she's going to him. So, if this incredibly wealthy, strong person is going to to Solomon, then Solomon must be. Even greater, even wiser, you know, even greater, wiser, more powerful. Mm -hmm. And she, how does Solomon receive her? He answered all her questions. Answered all her questions. Yeah. Every question she had. And what does as she's there? What does what does this this queen of Sheba? What does she see? All the wisdom of Solomon in the palace. Oh, the palace and the and the wisdom and his. 
his outfits and his servants and everything and yeah, food, you know, all this. And what does she say to Solomon? And she says the report she heard in her own country about his achievements and your wisdom is true. So everything she's heard about him is true. And what does she give him? You talk about getting and not giving. Uh, what does she, what does Solomon end up getting from the Queen of Sheba? Lord have mercy, she gives him a whole bunch of stuff. All right, so why, and, and what else is the fleet bringing? Oh, they're bringing wood, and they're bringing precious metals, and, and they're, they're bringing all kinds of stuff. And how is Solomon described as a host? I mean, that's because eventually she returns to her land, right? Mm -hmm. She leaves. Uh, how has Solomon been as a, as a host? He gave her what she desired. Everything, everything she desired. So great, great host. Now, what is the purpose of this Sheba story? I mean, and, and then she goes and we don't hear her again. It's not like she shows up later or somebody else from Sheba <clears throat> shows up. What's, what's the purpose of this story? Why, would it, the, why is the writer putting this in here? It shows that other leaders... We're talking about him. And talking respectfully. respectfully. You know, almost in all, right? Almost in all. Now, what was Solomon making? So he's got this trading going on. And it's not just in the Red Sea. It was later, it's Tarshish. And that's facing the Mediterranean. That's, that's in, in a part of Asia Minor, in Turkey. So what, what is Solomon making? What is he making good from this trade? Relationships. He's building good relationships. Yep, he certainly is. What else is he making? Um, Used to tell my kids when I was teaching school, this drives history. This drives history. What is he making? An empire. He's making an empire. Good relationships. Good relationships. Oh, y'all are so good. What else is he making? Money. Money, 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 money. You know, scratch history under any kind of historical movement, scratch beneath the surface, you're going to find money. Money, money, property, possessions, something. You know, and Solomon is making it hand over fist. He is bringing it in millions, millions of, of what would be dollars. You know, so if you equate it, you know, he's making tons of money. In fact, what does he start doing to show his wealth? Making another great throne. Well, he makes a, he makes a throne. Oh, but this is going to be, this, this isn't like David's. David's throne's kind of tacky. You know, what, how's he making this throne? Ivory. Oh, we're going to make it out of ivory. You know, which, which was a problem because when it got wet, it got slippery because that's what happens when soap gets wet. So we made this throne out of ivory. And, um, yeah, was, thank you. Thank you, Shelly. I appreciate you laughing. You know, that was, that was very kind. Um, no, yeah, ivory, yeah, yeah, yeah. That's, I actually got it. See, yeah, that's, see, there you go. Yeah, give, your, give yourself a scar. Yeah, give yourself a scar. Okay, the, uh, so. <laughs> what gets me is he's getting all this gold from all these other countries. I mean, we went from thinking about everybody uh, traveling around, the Israelites, the poor people, you know, the shepherds, and now we're, we're talking about these countries that have gold and, you know, all this wood to trade, and it's like, when did this all change? Mm -hmm. When did things when did they realize gold was uh, yeah, a commodity to be traded? R right. Well, when did it? When, when did in this story? Because that's what we got. When in this story did this change, start changing? It really started changing when we moved from, even from David, oh, that's you know, oh. to... To because Solomon, we got the wood to start building mm -hmm. from and and now what we got, what we end up with is a a country, but as the wealth is described, 
Whose wealth is it? Well, it should be God's wealth, but the writer doesn't say, oh, God got all this gold. Solomon. Solomon got all this gold. Now, like I said, one thing to file away, from this point on, the, the country is going to be identified with the king. You know, so if the king is wealthy, the country is wealthy. If the king is poor, the country is poor. If the king is spiritual, the country is, is right with God. If the king isn't, the country is not. So it's going to become more and more focused on these, on these kings. But I don't think it's an accident. That Remember when we talked about David, one of the things David did that we said showed that he was a really good king is that he was really conscious of taking care of people, you know, that he gave to people who were hungry. Um, we don't see that here. Um, now, we'll hear that in Jerusalem, they don't even use things made of silver anymore because silver you just throw out. You know, silver is disposable. You know, everything is made of gold. You know, it's, it's so prosperous, but it's more and more focused on, this, on the king and not, oh, the king is taking care of people. In fact, at near the end of this little account, we're going to see even his own people are not... They're not sharing the wealth, as Huey Long's talked about. They are not sharing the wealth uh, with Solomon. Okay, so he's, he's, bit, he's, he's drinking out of gold stuff. He's got gold drinking cups. You know, he takes some of the gold and he makes, which is interesting. What does he make with some of the gold? Right, right at the beginning. Shields. He makes shields out of gold. And that must be really good because the writer tells us how much gold is made in each of those shields. And when does he put the shield? Now, why is a gold shield a stupid thing to make? Heavy. Well, one is heavy and gold is really soft. Mm -hmm. You know, gold is really, really soft. You hold a gold shield up and somebody is facing you with bronze or facing you with iron, what's going to happen to your gold shield? It's going to go right through it. Gold shields are not used for war. You don't send an army out with gold shields unless you want them really tired and dead. So these gold shields are just for show. Are just for show right? Now this is going to be interesting. Later in the story we're going to find out what ends up happening to these gold shields. But I mean, that's, that's not a spoiler alert. It's going, to, it's going to be part of the story. The reason it's being dropped in here. Okay, but here is an example of, of he is so wealthy, he's, he's just making stuff for it, and he's putting it in his house. It's, the, the, it's not in the temple, it's in the cedar of Lebanon. You know, so that's his palace. So he's putting these gold shields there. In fact, again, the writer tells us the sh fleet is going. How does Solomon compare to other kings? He's the wealthy. He's the wealthy of, of all kings. And not only is he building up wealth and he's trading in the Red Sea and he's trading in the Mediterranean, and he's got this fleet and they're bringing in gold and he's, he's drinking from gold cups and he throws out stuff silver because nobody uses it because it is absolutely worthless in this gold Phil world, he is also building up. What else does he build up? Chariots. Chariots. He has chariots. And this large, and why are chariots important? They're war. They're instruments of war, like tanks. You know, chariots are a big deal. Uh, that's what the Hittites are going to put, uh, put iron on their tanks, uh, on their chariots. Which makes them really, really powerful. Mm -hmm. Heavy, but really strong. And the end says here he had 12,000 horses. Jeez Louise. How could you ride them all? I don't know. I don't know I either. Take awfully long legs. Yeah, awful <laughs> long legs. Yeah, absolutely. So he's got all these horses, and the horses are coming. Evidently, Egyptian horses are a big deal because they're coming from Egypt. And he is trading all over. He's exporting things to Hittites and all the way up. What does this show, all of this show, about Solomon's kingdom? Well, for one thing, it, it's very ornate. It is very ornate. It is very... Show off. <laughs> show it, you know, because it's really... It's large. Yeah. Large, wealthy, powerful. Everything written is to 
focus on conspicuous wealth. You know, this is a wealthy place. Sort of like King Solomon's mind. Well, well, <laughs> like, that's what people do. You know, that's what wealthy folks do. Mm -hmm. You know, I'm thinking of having some gold shields around my house. Oh, yeah. What about the lion um, entrance? What's that? What about the lion heads at the entrance? Well, um, I'm building the throne. I won't sit on it. Oh. That's going to be Debbie. Oh, we'll okay. sit on the, the ivory throne. Um, I'll, I'll uh, sit on one made of life boy. Made of what? Life, life boy. This is another so. Oh, oh this is okay. Another, yeah. I haven't heard that in a long time. I, I don't know. I, I'm, I'm sorry. Uh, what did you say? Uh, should have used something else. That's Among something. that list of things that he brought in that tell us that he was very successful, why did they throw in apes and bad movies? Yeah. Why would they throw that in? Why do you think they would throw that in? What does, it, what does that tell you about the writer and his audience? that they would throw that in. What, what has everything else in this account been focused on? What's been the purpose of this whole thing? To show his power. Show his power, show his wealth. Yes. You know, so why would he put apes and, and baboons? What's that? They're powerful. They're powerful. You know, that evidently this, these are exotic creatures bringing in these exotic creatures that aren't native to the Middle East. They're native to lands far away. That he is so powerful, he is bringing these, these exotic animals in, which must cost a lot, of, a lot money, of money. A lot of money. I mean, he talks about peacocks. Part of the trading is bringing in peacocks. And you know, beautiful. Well, yeah, beautiful. Well, why peacocks? You know, you don't eat them for Thanksgiving. Why would you bring in peacocks? <laughs> well, it must be for show, show, showing wealth. This again, this conspicuous wealth that that Solomon's kingdom. Everything in this story is focused on the same thing. That wow. this is wealth and power, right? Mm -hmm. Now. Solomon is at, and his kingdom's at its peak, right? When we end chapter 10. Mm -hmm. Chapter 11. How does chapter 11 begin? Tell him about how his four wives. Well, wife. Solomon has a weakness. <laughs> Women. <laughs> yeah, he has a, a weakness in particular, not just women, but four, four. foreign women. Okay, and he gives, the writer gives us some examples. Moabites and Edomites and Ammonites and Sodomites and Sodomites uh, and Hittites. Okay, now we could see this, and we've seen it before. We saw it with Pharaoh, and the writer doesn't say, just he married Pharaoh, started, and just went on. And you, you said, huh, that's interesting. He brought in foreign sailors, didn't say anything else. Huh. That's interesting. Now the writer tells us that there's a problem. And, and what is the problem with all these foreign wives? Well, he's getting older, and they, they, his wives turned his heart down to God. Well, he, yes, he even before God. that. Oh. Yeah, the Lord said, don't intermarry. Don't intermarry. Because if you do intermarry, there will be problems. And Solomon intermarried several times. A lot. Mm -hmm. <laughs> he, he intermarried a lot. Now, this, this idea of intermarriage is going, to be a, is going to be an interesting idea that's going to, going to continue. Because this is going to be a big, big deal way later in the book of Ezra. Because one of the things that Ezra will say when, with the people, is you got to put away your foreign wives. You know, if you're married to a foreigner, you got to put her away. Because you're supposed to marry good Jewish girls. What would he do? That's a quickie divorce. <laughs> you divorce them quick and put them away. You don't kill them, but you say, Go away. good luck. <laughs> good luck with that. 
Um, and, and that becomes a thing. But one of the interesting things we see in Scripture, and, and I was talking to a guy just the other day about it, is, and this is what makes it so exciting to study, they, they will put forth an argument, like put away foreign life. The answer is really clear. You gotta, if, if you're married to a foreigner, you may love her. She may be the best gal on earth. You know what? You gotta tell her to hit the bricks because that's just the way it is. Uh, we get, so there it is, in the Word of God. We read it and say, oh, well, we need to put away foreign wives. Yeah, if we're married to a non-Christian. But then we have written about the same time, taking place at a different time, you know, but being produced at the time when Ezra is being written, is another little book called Ruth. And Ruth becomes interesting because Ruth is a Moabite. And she marries a good Jewish boy. And Ruth becomes the mother of... She becomes the, the mother eventually of, of David and for, for Christians on. Yeah, Ruth is mentioned in the line. One of the few women in, in Matthew mentioned in the line. So what, what is cool is we've got this one clear, put away foreign wives, boom. But then in the same scripture, you got a, a story about a, a, a foreign wife who ends up becoming the mother of the nation. So you always, in scripture, we have this tension. And they are very aware. They're too, these people are too smart not to know that Ruth doesn't fit with Ezra any more than uh, Job fits with, with um, Proverbs. They just don't. There's tension there. To explain that maybe life isn't as easy as you'd like it to be. So anyway, but he's right here, the writer tells us, he's violating God's law. Not a shock because he's done it before. He's broken the law you know, when he enslaved aliens in the land. He broke the law, but this seems to be a big one because the writer is concerned about the spiritual condition of the nation. And what, what, does, what do these four, and, and he's only got a few, so it's not like it's a big deal. He just, he doesn't have many wives. 700. 700 wives. And 320 All of them, tell, every wife telling him how to, to go oh when gosh. he's in a chariot. When he's traveling to town, every one of the 700 are saying, you need to ask for directions. How does he remember their names? Yeah, well, I don't know. Maybe just numbers. Maybe. They just have numbers. But it's not just 700 wives, because 700 wives isn't enough. He's also got 300 concubines, which are sort of wives second class. So he's got a lot. Now, why would he have so many wives? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> well, I'm not asking for on a personal Thing. You know, why would, a, why would a king have so many wives? Because he could. Well, one, he could, and that shows power. He, you know, but what else does it, why else would a king, what's that? He was greedy. Well, he was, he was. Or for his lineage, too. Well, lineage, although imagine the number of kids running around that says, Solomon is my daddy. Uh, you know, you got a lot of kids running amok. Um, political. Remember, we talked about it with Pharaoh's daughter. Why would he marry Pharaoh's daughter? Well, because you got a little. This is seals a political alliance. And since Solomon is so powerful and so important, you know, he he's marrying in order to secure political alliances, relationships with other with other countries. So there's a there's a, a political reason for it, but the writer doesn't say that. The writer says he loved foreign women. And that's why he has all the wives. So we, we trust the writer. We don't need to add anything to it. And what do these all these foreign women do? Shelley, you mentioned it. Worship different gods. Worship different gods. And some of the gods are, are mentioned. Uh, Astarte, which is the goddess of the Sodomites. And remember, I told you one of the things that uh, was going to be a temptation anyway is once they settle in the land, how are they going to, do and I'm not talking about Solomon, and the, the top notch, the, the top of the cream of the crop, but the, the average guy. How, how is he earning a living? What, what is he doing to support himself? 
once he said. What part of the economy picks up when you stop being a herder and settle down? What do you mean? Well, well, you trade? Farming. You start farming. You, you start farming because you're settled in the land. It's a whole lot easier to farm than to follow a flock around, right? And you can get, you know, you can get a lot of protein from what you're raising, you know, rather than following this, this flock around. So you, you, once you settle down, you, you don't really need a God that leads you. You know, the God of Israel led Israel. You don't need a God to lead you anywhere because you're there. What you need is a God that will do what? Help you raise your crop. Help you raise your crop. Therefore, what kind of God are you going to look for? If you want a God that's going to help you, not going to lead you to green pastures. You don't want a God. You're a farmer. You don't want a God to lead you to green pastures. You got them. You don't want a God to lead you to still waters. That means you're traveling. You're going to leave your farm? No. You want a God to, that does what? Provides rain, good soil. good soil. You start, you you start getting into fertility gods and goddesses. And Astari, that's Astari. That's what she was. She was a fertility goddess. You know, to make the soil fertile, make the crops grow. Well, she's she's the god of the Sodom. Now, this isn't Sodomites. Sodomites. You know, they're on the coast, near just south of Tyre. So they're, they're Phoenician, Philistinian, you know, Philistines are sort of Phoenicians, you know. So they start worshiping, some of his wives worship her, which becomes really attractive to the people too. Others worship Milcom, which is kind of a, a, the same as the Lord God only to the Ammonites. So he's, he ends up worshiping, and, and how does the writer describe what Solomon is doing. So he's got all these wives and they turn him to worship these other gods. You know, the husband usually goes to his wife's church and they kind of turn his head. And, but how does the writer describe it? It was evil. They say it was, he says it was evil, an abomination in the eyes of God. Okay. Uh, and didn't he didn't something David didn't do? David did a lot of stuff that was bad, but he didn't worship other gods. But Sol, his son Solomon is. In fact, to make it even worse, what does he do? He builds places to worship. He builds places to worship, high places to these gods. He, um, he even he offers in sacrifice. To the, these guys. Now, how does God? Re- how does the Lord respond? He's angry. angry. The Lord is angry. And now, one just in this, in the ancient world, the people who are reading, writing, the persons writing this, and, and people who are reading it, they have a kind of a different view of gods than we do, because we kind of get the idea that there's one God, and that's it, and you either worship. I, when I was teaching, and when I was teaching high school, part of the, what I had to teach was religion. That was part of the religion. I used to tell them Christianity, Judaism, and Islam are unique religions in that they are exclusive religions because they all worship a God. Now, it may all be the same name because Allah is God in Arabic. So it's just, they call God the same thing. But you can't worship the God, the Christian God, and the God of Islam, because they're different. I mean, they, they, you got to worship one. You either worship that God or you worship a false God, one that doesn't exist because there's only one God. So you're either wrong or you worship this God. That's not the way ancient people viewed it. Uh, you, you could worship every nation had gods that protected the nation. So it wasn't an idea that every nation had to worship one God. You know, you worship the God that protected you or did what you wanted it to do. If you wanted your crops to grow, you worship a fertility God. If you wanted it to rain, you worshiped a storm God. That's the kind of stuff you did in the ancient world. In fact, we see in, in a psalm, one of the psalms, that it talks about God being the Lord, the Lord God being Lord over all gods. And they were serious. I mean, they meant it. Over all gods, because the concept wasn't that these were false gods, and but the Lord God is above them all. 
they had this idea of like a heavenly court where you had sort of messengers and God over, but God, the Lord God was over them all. So he was, what he was doing was he was just setting up altars to, to the gods for his wife, not thinking, oh, I, gotta, I can't worship the God of Israel anymore. I got to worship the God of Moab. That's not, the, that's not the concept. I can worship all of them. You know, that's what the pantheon in Rome means, all gods. So you could go to the pantheon and worship them all. You know, so it wasn't like you had, a, it wasn't exclusive. You could have worship more than one. And that's what Solomon is doing. But the Lord God is a jealous God. That's what he says in the, the Ten Commandments. And you don't worship other gods if you're worshiping the Lord God. They may exist, but you worship the Lord God. He is above all other gods. Where did these like other gods come from? I mean, if they started out the Lord God Almighty. Well, the other, because people are, how do other gods develop? Yeah. You know, the concept of, of, of other gods. Well, you're living in a place, if you don't know anything about the Lord God, then you hope that there's something greater than yourself, and there's a lot of questions you can't answer. Mm -hmm. And so you start attributing it to something. There must be something out there. There's got to be something that controls the rain. There must be something that leads. There must be something that makes the soil fertile. What is it? Well, it's got to be something out there. So that's who I'm going to, and I'm going to give him a name. You know, I'm not stupid. I don't necessarily believe that's his real name, but I'm going to give him a name so I can communicate with him. And I'm going to worship that God or a whole bunch of gods. You know, maybe he controls this or she controls that. And so it's, it's sort of a social development that people develop because they feel there's something beyond themselves. Yeah. That's not what this writer is saying. You know, these, these are sub-gods. Uh, or false gods, but they aren't. They don't reflect the true God. Mm -hmm. And for Solomon to do this, he's turning this back on the Lord. true God. And what ends up happening once Solomon makes this decision that he is going to allow the worship of all kinds of gods? What does what ends up happening? Well, God tells him, since you know his attitude has not kept his covenant. And his decrees, which he commanded him, so he's going to take it away. Going to take away the kingdom, but he's not going to take it away from Solomon. Solomon, because he made a promise to David. So he's not going to take it away from Solomon, but he will take it away from Solomon. Solomon's son. Solomon. We'll take it away from Solomon's son. But even before Solomon dies in this incredibly powerful kingdom, what ends up happening? Problems. Solomon all of a sudden encounters problems he didn't face before. In particular, what? What problems did he face? Does Solomon start facing that he didn't have to worry about in the past? Adversaries. He has to worry about adversaries. And most the first adversaries he talks about are external, right? Yeah. You know, Edom. And remember, Edom has that interesting, you know, kind of an interesting history. Uh, the Edomites are uh, you know, kind of related to the Jews, you know, according to Genesis. So you, you have the, uh, through um, Ishmael. So the Edomites, you know, you got issues. He starts having issues with them. So he has some problems with foreign. And, and, and that's, a, that's not good, but there's another problem that he has that isn't external. Who is mentioned in verse 26 of chapter 11? Jeroboam. 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 And we know what Jeroboam is. What is Jeroboam? He's one of, uh, originally of Solomon's officials. He's one of his officials. And what, what is he? Ephraimite. He's an Ephraimite. Ephraim. And, and an Eph why is that important that he's an Ephraimite? Enough that the writer put it in there. What is... What is Ephraim? We've heard it before. What is, what is Ephraim? Oh. Or maybe who better? Who was Ephraim? Is that the split from Esau? No. no. Remember when way back in Genesis, Joseph is is uh, brings his brothers and Israel into Egypt. 
and he has 12 brothers. He has two sons. Joseph has two sons. Manasseh is one, and the other one is Ephraim. Ephraim is. And remember, jo- Joseph uh, and Manasseh is the older, and Ephraim is the younger. And Joseph wants, when he blesses, puts his right hand on Ephraim, and they say, oops, that's a mistake. And they switch him. No, no, not Joseph. Takes him to, to Israel before Israel dies to bless his two sons because Joseph moves him. And he, Israel puts his hand, or Jacob puts his hand, maybe Jacob is the same person, puts his right hand on him, and Joseph reverses him, and then Jacob crosses his hands because Ephraim is going to carry the promise. That's going to be the, that's the dominant tribe in the north. That's the big northern tribe is Ephraim. And, and Jeroboam. So that's, that's the important. Now understand, Solomon has, has sort of crossed over tribal lines. For Solomon, this isn't, this isn't an issue because he wants to bring his country together. He doesn't want to be a confederation of 12 tribes. He wants to be the king of a unified nation and you don't want to keep on reminding people that you're not an Israelite. What you are is an Ephraimite or a Danite or a uh, uh, you know, a Jew, uh, uh, somebody from Judah or, or Asher. You don't want to do that. You want to create a national identity. And he mentions Ephraimite here. So, uh, so Jeroboam is is um, uh, Ephraimite. What does the writer tell us that Jeroboam does? What does Jeroboam do in verse twenty six? He rebels. So he rebels against Solomon. So we've got external problems, but we've got this internal problem right here. And why is it that he rebels against Solomon? Because you said he was an official, right? What, what was his job as he worked he was in charge of all the labor. Okay, he was in charge of the labor, building these cities. And we already talked about that Solomon worked on these cities. But it was, and he was in charge of the labor force, right? Force, the forced labor, which means labor that isn't voluntary. Where was the forced labor coming from? Foreign. Hmm. 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 What does it say here in verse 28? Put him in charge of the whole labor force. Let's see. The man Jeroboam was very able. And when Solomon saw that the young man was industrious, he gave him charge over all the forced labor of the, of the house of Joseph. Which he is part of. Which he is part of. Whoa. Earlier it said Solomon only enslaved foreigners, but left the Israelites alone. What is, uh, what's Jeroboam's job? To oversee forced labor where? Among the house of Joseph, which means Ephraim. So he is enforcing, he is the taskmaster for Israelis who are being forced to work. Whoa. Do you think the people in Ephraim were happy with Solomon? No. Oh, no. 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 Now, what happens? So Jeroboam, that's who he is. What, what happens to Jeroboam? Ahijah is a prophet. We've seen before. In fact, he was a big supporter of Solomon early on. What does Ahijah do with Jeroboam? His new cloak and tore it. Okay. Tears up his new clothes into 12 parts. Mm -hmm. And he does what? Gives them the. the... Gives 10 to Jeroboam? Yeah. Okay. Jeroboam, you take 10 and leave two. What what symbolically does that mean? 10 tribes of Israel. 10 tribes of Israel are going to be. Separate, right? Are, yeah. are not going to, are going to be who's? Who's going to rule those ten tribes? Jeroboam. Jeroboam is, right? And only two are going to be left to whoever follows Solomon. 
And uh, why, is this, why is this happening? What does the prophet tell Jeroboam about why this is happening? Because they worship God. Because Solomon's worshiping for these foreign gods. Are worshiping these foreign gods. And that is not acceptable. So like, just like it said earlier, the Lord's taking, taking away 10 of the 12 tribes from the Davidic, from David, from the house of David. But what are the conditions? Because Jerry, he's, the Lord's going to do this. And the Lord will, will bless Jeroboam, right? I mean, Jeroboam is going to kind of be the Lord's man in the future if what? If he does what the Lord says, right? So, in a sense, what does, through Ahasha, what does the Lord do with Jeroboam? What is the Lord doing with this Ephraimite Jeroboam? He's making a covenant. We got another covenant here. So this is what the Lord will do. This is what you're supposed to do. Now, while this is, and that's the background for why is Jeroboam rebelling against Solomon? This is the reason he's rebelling against Solomon. And what does Solomon do? Try to kill him. Try to kill him. Ooh, I'm having deja vu. <laughs> I've heard this story before. Yeah. When did I hear this before? Oh, ho, ho, Saul and David, same sort of thing. Only now it's Solomon that's trying to kill old man Solomon because he is old. Because uh, we've already been told he's old. Is trying to kill Jeroboam and Jeroboam has to go to Egypt, right? And what happens then to Solomon? So we've got Jeroboam who now has this promise from God. Therefore, we know certain things are going to happen. We know because God has promised it, that the kingdom is going to be split, right? What ends up happening is, and why is it going to be split? Because Solomon didn't obey the Lord. Solomon didn't obey the Lord. Uh, what, how does the Solomon story end? Solomon dies. Solomon dies, right? Mm -hmm. And who, and he's buried with his father, and if you want to read more, which tells us that there's stuff written, we just don't have it. You know, because he makes reference to it. That it's some, it, it may be, probably isn't anyway, because, you know, they're writing on the skin of reeds. Yeah. So you assume uh, that it's not around anymore. The best translation of the New Testament, the was discovered, complete, the most complete ancient translation of the New Testament was discovered somewhere in the mid-19th uh, century in a monastery in, si in, in Sinai, in, in what is Egypt, uh, which is good because it's really dry, so things don't mold. And decay. It was found there. It's called si Sinaiticus. It's Codex si Sinaiticus. And it was found there, most complete translation of the New Testament. The monks in the monastery didn't know what they had. And when they found it, it was in a pile of these reed things, a whole bunch of these reed things. And the monks were burning them for heat. Oh, my goodness. <laughs> and it's the, it's the most ancient and complete translation of the New, Te uh, of the New Testament that we have. So these things were written. Who knows what happened to them? They, no, they, this is it. So it doesn't exist anymore. If it does, it's buried somewhere in, the de in a desert. Okay, so he dies. Who's going to be his, who follows him? Rehoboam. And I always thought if I had twin boys, I guess it could be girls too, could name one of them Jeroboam and the other Rehoboam. That would be kind of cute. Yeah, yeah. Debbie would never let me do it, uh, ever. Okay, so how would you describe Solomon's reign? So Solomon is now dead. How would you describe his reign? Uh, exciting. Exciting, yeah, yeah. 
was Confl- until he did not follow the Lord. Okay, good until he stopped following the Lord. Mm-hmm. And then... The downfall. Then, then it went, went down. Now, Rehoboam, though, was king over Israel, right? His son says, when he dies, succeeds, succeeds it, right? So, he's, so something is going to have to happen. To the kingdom, right? Because it's still one kingdom and it's still, even though it's facing some external threats and may not be what it was, it's still pretty strong. So something is going to have to happen and that's what we'll look at next week. In 12, we'll look at 12, 1 through 14, 20 and we'll look at the division, the division of the kingdom. Now, Rehoboam, uh, Jeroboam, uh, we know because the writer tells us, is going to be king over the ten tribes. The ten tribes are going to have a problem because the ten tribes are not going to have Jerusalem. And if you don't have Jerusalem, you don't have the temple. And the temple is where the Lord lives. And that's going to be a problem for the, for the northern tribes. That's going to be a big, tribe, big problem for the northern tribes. So, okay, any questions about about Solomon is an interesting, is is an interesting figure. He's not, I don't think he's a tragic, David's almost a tragic figure. But Solomon, and Solomon I'm not sure he is, but he certainly is sad. You know, he's kind of a sad figure there at the end. Yeah, especially when he started out, you know, being with God, talking to God, and following God, and, and how much he was blessed. And then it, he became... Everything became so much the riches, the, the, you know, so much going on in his life that he just sort of fell away, and that's that's the shame of the whole thing. Yeah, yeah. I, I think there's a lot of lessons we can kind of take from the Solomon story. You know, how easy it is, easy it is to shift. Uh, and like I said, he wasn't, so I, when Solomon died, I think if you'd asked him, do you worship the Lord God? He'd have said, yes. Absolutely. Absolutely. Well, how come you have these? You built your wife a shrine to uh, Astarte. Well, she has. That's fine. You know. Well, how about these others? Well, that's fine. How easy it is to to lose focus. How easy it is to lose focus. And how they live in. You know, like he had like his house, and his wife had her house, and you know, he must have built a walkway between the two. <laughs> well. And he had 700 of them. So oh, yes. where, you know, did he build them each houses? No. Pardon. Because that's like a little town. No, I think that's you know. sort of like the... That man, becomes a... His man squeeze. <laughs> <laughs> that becomes the wife house. Yeah. Uh, yes. All right, let's have a word of prayer, and next week we'll talk about the division of the kingdom. Lord God, thank you so much for guiding us through this. Uh, remind us of the story of Solomon. Uh, certainly remind us of the glory and the power because that's who you are. You're a God of great power and a God of great glory. And we can see that on earth through Solomon's temple and through his, his kingdom. But also remind us that, that you've called us to worship you. Um, and when we become distracted by other things and um, other gods, other situations, that we, we run into real danger of not keeping our focus on you and on what you've called us to do. So help us to resist temptation to be distracted and help our vision be focused. In the name of Christ we pray, amen. amen.